It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Alexis Cutchins. She is a member of our Emory Women's Heart Center team based out of Emory University Hospital at Midtown. She's originally from New York City. She obtained her medical degree at Emory and did her internal medicine residency at Cornell. She then joined her, uh, the Emory faculty in 2012. Uh, I should mention she did her cardiology research fellowship uh, at the University of Virginia. She's a key member and leader uh, with the Emory Women's Heart Center. She uh, leads the Go Red campaign at Emory that we do at Midtown every February. She is the director of the Anti-Coagulation Management Services since 2014 and was recently named the director of the Echo Lab at the Emory University Hospital at Midtown. This morning, she will be speaking to us about something that we have all seen, I would say, at this point in time within the COVID pandemic, and certainly if you haven't come across it, you definitely will. POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, and long haul COVID. We'll turn it over to Dr. Cutchins. Hi, my name is Alexis Cutchins. I'm a general cardiologist with the Emory Women's Heart Center, and I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much to Gina and Ijeoma for um, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, hopefully it's gonna be useful for everyone in the audience. Uh, I'll be discussing today POTS post COVID, which I think will be relevant to all of us. Um, there are a lot of patients with COVID out there right now and a lot of COVID long haulers, which is what we're gonna be addressing today. I have no financial relationship to disclose. However, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is from personal experience with patients. Uh, there's not a lot of research on this topic, nor are, is there a lot of data to go over. So um, with that being said, let's get started. We'll start with this clinical vignette. Um, I gave a similar presentation in September of 2020, and uh, I used this patient as an example, 23-year-old woman with a history of seasonal allergies only, was diagnosed with COVID in early April 2020. She had a mild course that lasted about six weeks with symptoms, no hospitalization. And in May, she was seen for chest pain and tachycardia. She had a negative CT scan for PE at the time. Her heart rate, however, would go to the 140s after walking into the kitchen. And she had associated sharp chest pain that progressed to the right arm and shoulder pain. She had no syncope, but she had presyncopal episodes. Her echo was normal. Before COVID, her resting heart rate was in the, in the 50s to 60s with a, heart, with a blood pressure of 120 over 80. After COVID, her resting heart rate was in the hundreds with a, high blood, with a higher blood pressure in the 130s to 150s over 90. April 2020, right. So uh, I've seen several patients, all with milder symptoms, not hospitalized with COVID, who have subsequently developed heart rates that spike with standing or walking. Uh, they develop also chest pain, presyncope, shortness of breath, and um, difficulty with exertion. All of these patients that I've seen have had normal echoes, normal cardiac workups, uh, negative cardiac MRIs when indicated, and their blood pressure seemed to be elevated prior since when compared to your prior to COVID levels. So what is this? What's going on? Uh, this was an article in the Atlantic from September 4th of 2020, did COVID-19 mess up my heart? I got sick six months ago. Now I can barely make it up the stairs. These were the first anecdotal reports of what we're seeing so much of now, which is this um, erratic heart rate and uh, autonomic dysfunction after COVID that people are now calling long COVID or COVID long hauler syndrome. At that time in September on a Women in Cardiology Facebook group, I was noticing these kinds of questions a lot. Uh, this is a cardiologist that posted in, on August 31st of 2020. I just saw five young patients, 40 and under today, who had COVID two to four months ago, all with chest pain, shortness of breath, and palpitations. Is there anything to this? What are the late cardiovascular sequelae? She was aware of myocarditis, heart failure, arrhythmia, but um, what was going on with these other patients. So since then, we've discovered some more, um, some more information. The first case report about POTS um, post-COVID was actually published by um, Dr. Miglis uh, in August of 2020. He demonstrated a, a young woman, she was about 20 years old, who 
um, had a positive tilt table test after COVID, uh, was, had significant POTS symptoms, and uh, was diagnosed with POTS. But since then, we've had other articles come out. This was uh, March 2021. That was a, a case series on 20 patients with POTS or autonomic dysfunction and disorders after having COVID-19 infection. Here's another one, autonomic dysfunction and long COVID, rationale, physiology, and management strategies. Um, so there you can see this, it's, been, it's coming up and up. Post COVID-19 syndrome associated with orthostatic cerebral hypoperfusion syndrome, small, small fiber neuropathy, uh, the benefit of immunotherapy. This was one case report. So what do we do with these people who are coming into our clinics? complaining of tachycardia, shortness of breath, all of these symptoms that are, are continuing to put them out of commission after they've already had COVID and their COVID symptoms have resolved. Um, I approach these patients, you know, like I do any other patients, um, Holter or event monitor can be very useful, especially if, you're, if you think there may be some sort of um, arrhythmia going on but it can demonstrate some tachycardia or inappropriate sinus tachycardia. An echo is useful just in case there is something else going on. Usually it's normal. I always do orthostatics in the office, um, lying, sitting, and standing blood pressure and heart rate. The tilt table test is very useful and we'll get to that later. But much of the diagnosis when it comes to POTS is coming from the history. Um, I really spend a lot of time ask, uh, talking to these patients about their symptoms and trying to figure out exactly when everything started and uh, what they've been experiencing. So what do you do during the COVID pandemic? Uh, when these patients were starting to pop up into my clinic, I was 100% virtual. So I had them do their own orthostatics at home, lying, sitting and standing, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, I would record their heart rate after 10 minutes of standing. I would try to have them do this before they saw me over Zoom. Uh, my nurse would help them sort of talk them through it. Uh, I would get, a, again, a detailed symptom history. And you, know, you can diagnose POTS with just these simple uh, approaches. If your heart rate goes up by 30 beats per minute or up to 120 beats per minute after standing from a supine position, then, um, then you've got pretty much, you've got a diagnosis of POTS and you can really move forward from there. So what's POTS? Um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's the most prevalent, prevalent form of orthostatic intolerance. Uh, it's estimated about 500,000 Americans suffer from this. However, now that we have gone through a year plus, a year and a half of this COVID pandemic, I would not be surprised if that doubled. Um, it presents in patients who are relatively young, usually women more than men, um, ages about 14 to 45. It's the most common syndrome of patients seen in autonomic dysfunction clinics. And um, it really results from a failure of peripheral vasoconstriction. We'll get to that. So the normal physiology of standing um, is that 30% of blood volume is in the thorax when you're supine. Um, when you stand up, 300 to 800 milliliters of blood gravitates um, to, the lower, to the abdomen and lower extremities. There's a decrease in venous return, stroke volume, and cardiac output when this happens. Arterial baroreceptors detect a drop in pulse pressure and stroke volume, which increases sympathetic output and decreases the parasympathetic. In normal patients, this will result in a 10 to 15 beat per minute increase in heart rate and an increase in diastolic blood pressure for about 10 millimeters mercury. That's normal. Um, so what's going on with POTS? The pathophysiology is very broad and um, you know, not well understood, but there are several different types. There's neuropathic, hyperagenergic, genetic, hypovolemic, and um, a mechanism of cerebral, impaired cerebral autoregulation. So in the neuro neuropathic form, 50% uh, of POTS patients have anhydrosis of the leg. Uh, they have abnormal muscle sympathetic nerve activity, impaired leg arterial or vasoconstriction, which leads to enhanced venous pooling. This venous pooling and um, decreased you know, vasoconstriction is what causes the symptoms of POTS. 
the hyperadrenergic form, which is about 30% of POTS patients, they have an elevated standing uh, catecholamine level. They have a hyperadrenergic response, which could be compensatory for hypovolemia or peripheral dysautonomia. Often these patients have resting elevated blood pressures compared to other patients with POTS. Many patients that I diagnose with POTS tell me that they've always had a very low blood pressure and that's chronic for them. And then somehow they developed POTS um, from a stressor, from an illness, from, you know, there was some trigger that occurred that now makes their, their tachycardia occur with standing. The patients with lower blood pressures actually don't tolerate that tachycardia as well, but most patients with POTS don't really have fluctuations in their blood pressures. However, those that have lower blood pressures don't tolerate it as well, obviously. You can have a genetic predisposition. So there's a mutation encoding the norepinephrine transporter protein. Um, it impairs the reuptake of norepinephrine, resulting in excessive sympathetic stimulation and this tachycardia is standing. Hypovolemia uh, causes POTS symptoms. Uh, so a low red blood cell volume can occur in POTS patients, aggravating symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. You can have relative hypovolemia, which occurs from venous pooling and capillary leakage. Also low renin levels in hypovolemic POTS patients, which impairs sodium retention. That can be explained by renal sympathetic denervation, impairing renin release. The impaired cerebral autoregulation patients um, have excessive decrease in cerebral blood flow during tilt testing. This is often demonstrated in fact by transcranial Doppler. There are studies that have proven that there's decreased cerebral uh, blood flow during standing uh, with POTS patients. It can be due to a combination of ex excessive sympathetic outflow to the cerebral vasculature and hyperventilation in addition to the tachycardia. So where does POTS come from? Um, you know, we discussed some of these path pathophysiology, uh, cardiovascular deconditioning, reflex abnormalities, increased sympathetic activity, genetic abnormalities, but also post-viral or tick-borne illness, which is what we're seeing with the COVID population. The mechanism here is thought to be something inflammatory slash autoimmune. However, no one has really proven the exact pathophysiology be behind this dysautonomia related to the viral or tick-borne illness. So people with POTS often have associated disorders, mitral valve prolapse, chronic fatigue syndrome, mast cell activation abnormalities, Ehlers-Danlos and joint hypermobility, and Raynaud's syndrome. So with post-COVID POTS, um, I've seen this occurring in otherwise healthy patients. They don't have these associated uh, syndromes. Uh, they were perfectly healthy young people before they got COVID. Uh, most of them were quite active and, in fact, athletic. I, most of my patients would exercise multiple times a week, um, had really no predisposition, pre predisposing factors. Um, it doesn't seem, you don't seem to need to have any kind of underlying condition to get POTS after having COVID. Well, it seems to affect women more than men. Uh, I have been seeing a startling number of men in my clinic with long hauler symptoms and um, post-COVID long hauler syndrome. So it, it really does affect both genders. So the clinical features of POTS are broad. Uh, dizziness, lightheadedness, weakness, blurred vision, fatigue, and brain fog, uh, palpitations, tremulousness, anxiety, nausea, abdominal cramps, bloating, constipation, and diarrhea. A symptom onset can be abrupt or gradual, often starts after some sort of life stressor. Uh, patients have told me that their you know, spouse died or a family member got sick, or there was some stressful event that occurred in their life, and then they started developing the symptoms. Often patients tell me they wake up you know, one morning and just their heart rate is out of control and they don't know why. Symptoms can wax and wane or be very persistent. It can be either. They can be aggravated by exercise, uh, postprandial state, carbohydrate intake, menstruation, and heat, either a hot environment or a hot shower or bath. So here's a picture of a patient. Uh, the top, it's, uh, the two top two frames, A and B. A is a patient with um, 
Potts, who is standing in the stand-up tilt table test, and you can see that the vena is pooling in her lower extremities. When she uh, tilts back to the supine position, that venous congestion resolves right here. Um, the joint hypermobility hyper and patients such as what, what you see in patients with ehlers danlos syndrome is this demonstrated in C and D. I um, mean, these are these are physical exam findings that you can look for to um, support your diagnosis of POTS. So how do you diagnose POTS? Exaggerated increase in heart rate with standing or tilt table tests. It's an increase of heart rate that's greater than 30 beats per minute or an increase to 120 beats per minute within 10 minutes of standing tilt. So going from supine position to standing. There's usually no orthostatic hypertension. Here's a table of tilt table results. Um, you can see in the first column, there's a demonstration of autonomic failure. On top is the heart rate, below is the blood pressure. With pure autonomic failure, you really just get a hypo orthostatic hypertension with standing from the tilt table test. In neurally mediated syncope, after standing for some time, you get a dramatic drop in, in heart rate and blood pressure, and this is what causes the syncope. In POTS, you get a, a rapid rise in heart rate that's sustained, but no change in blood pressure, as you can see below. This rapid rise in heart rate and sustained um, high rate is what ultimately causes a single flow down to occur. So what's the differential diagnosis? These patients um, could have some sort of aut other autonomic neuropathy, central dysautonomia, a bed rest deconditioning is you know, very similar. Uh, it could be a side effect of the medication. Uh, I do a complete medication history on my patients when they come in to make sure we're not dealing with something that is as easy as stopping something that they're taking. Uh, dehydration, theochromocytoma, anemia, all of this needs to be ruled out before you label someone with a POTS diagnosis. Many patients with POTS, um, they thought maybe thought to have a panic disorder, anxiety, somatization disorder, chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, this is due to the vague nature of their symptoms and the systemic nature of their complaints. Uh, usually there's no abnormal functional tests. So these patients have seen multiple doctors. They've been told their echo is normal. Their event monitor is normal. We don't see anything wrong with their blood work. You're making this all up essentially, or you're anxious, or you know we can't figure out what's wrong with you. So recognizing this diagnosis and va validating these patients' concerns is key to the first step in taking care of them. So what do we do? We have a patient who we've diagnosed with POTS and now we need to treat it. And there's very few randomized controlled trials looking at the treatment of POTS. There was one study of 31 patients that demonstrated less symptoms in patients randomized to a jogging program after three months. Um, that's here, short-term exercise training. Essentially, the study showed improved exercise capacity and heart rate recovery, but did not evaluate symptomatic improvements. Uh, but it did show that exercise was a key component in terms of regaining normal heart rate and functional capacity. Um, here, there was a study that looked at exercise training versus propranolol in the treatment of POTS. And what they found in only 19 patients studied was that the quality of life uh, in these patients was improved um, with exercise, but not with propranolol. They suggested that uh, treating POTS with exercise is superior to propranolol. And um, it, they did, were able to restore upright and standardize, normalizing renin adrenal responsiveness and improving the patient's quality. This is great. It was only 19 patients, so you know, obviously there's more research that needs to be done. The problem with exercise is that patients find it very hard to exercise because their symptoms are so profound. Even when asked to do minimal amount or to use a recumbent bike or a rower, they really have a hard time because their heart rate pops up, they can pass out very easily, um, or develop chest pain, shortness of breath, and have to really stop. So how do we get patients to the point where they can exercise and really uh, improve their POTS symptoms? The first step is a lot of education and lifestyle modification. So I tell my patients that they need to stay hydrated and they need to expand their intravascular volume. 
They can do this by drinking at least 64 ounces of water a day. I really shoot for 70 to 90 ounces. Um, and it should be done throughout the day, not just you know in one big serving first thing in the morning. I also uh, ask my patients to use electrolyte replacement fluids, either Gatorade, Powerade, Drip Drop, Liquid IV, those are powders that you can add to the water to help with salt retention and uh, hydration. I tell them to liberalize their salt and I tell them to eat three to six grams of salt a day. And I really ask them to look at what they're eating, look at the sodium content in the foods that they're, they're taking in and add it all up and really target that higher sodium level. Um, we sometimes use saline infusion to increase the intravascular volume. That's a last resort. And then iron I use often, especially even if patients aren't anemic, if they're iron deficient, the iron will help with the volume expansion and help with their symptoms. So here is an article that was published in Jack recently um, demonstrating the effect of a high sodium diet in POTS patients. It was it randomized 14 patients um, with POTS and uh, 13 healthy controls to a high sodium diet and demonstrated volume expansion uh, in the bloodstream and a decrease in heart rate and symptoms. Um, you know, small study, but yes, so salt works, which is good. Um, another approach to these patients is to limit the venous pool. And we talked a lot about that in the pathophysiology of this uh, syndrome. So I tell patients to avoid standing for long periods of time and to wear compression hose. Uh, thigh high or waist high compression is best, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury in strength. Uh, but some people don't tolerate the compression hose. They're hot, they're uncomfortable. Patients with mast cell activation syndrome, which is a, a, goes very closely with POTS, seem to you know, break out in a rash, have a real um, intolerance for the compression. So I really encourage patients to try different styles. Um, some patients find that wearing a legging without uh, coverage of their foot is better than a complete compression pose that covers their foot. Um, there's also different levels of gradation. So you can do an 18 to 20 millimeter mercury or a 15 to 18, and maybe that's all they can tolerate, but anything is better than nothing is what I try to impart with these patients. Um, most of my patients who start consistently wearing compression really do notice a difference. And if they can tolerate it, it, it does help a lot. In fact, there are a couple of studies out there that show that this helps. Um, again, small studies. This one in the Journal of Pediatrics came out in 2014, 20 patients, but increased symptoms, um, abdominal and lower extremity compression, decreased symptoms in postural tachycardia syndrome um, during tilt table testing. This one, which was more recent in the Journal of the American Heart Association, uh, showed uh, compression along with propranolol at reducing uh, symptoms in a small population of patients. Uh, so, you know, there might've been some confounding there on the beta blocker, but uh, both of the, you know, there is some data that shows that the compression. So salt tablets, I use um, one to three grams daily. The salt tablet comes in one gram pill. So I, I try to, Tell patients to take this first thing in the morning with a large glass of water, ideally before getting out of bed, so you can start that rehydration process early before you even start moving around. Um, you know, if patients tolerate salt tablets, some of them really don't like salty foods, don't want to add salt to their food, just can't tolerate the salty diet, so the salt tablets are helpful. On the other hand, some patients really can't tolerate the salt tablet because they get very nauseous from it, it makes their stomach upset, so it, it's one option. I have found supplementing with alpha lipoic acid in some patients to be quite helpful. Actually, I have no data for this. This is anecdotal, and this is something that people who treat patients with POTS have used for a very long time. Um, 300 milligrams twice a day is usually how we start this. And then vitamin D supplementation. If the patient's is vitamin D deficient, uh, supplementing the vitamin D does help with, with those symptoms. So, other than lifestyle modification and supplements, what else do we do? Uh, medications. So we use a variety of medications to help these patients. A lot of the time, these are I'm using these medications really to get them to a point where they can start exercising. And the exercising is key as we have demonstrated. So 
Fluted cortisone is a mineralocorticoid that promotes sodium and fluid retention and improves the sensitivity of alpha adrenergic receptors. We can, you can start at 0.05 to 0.1 daily and go up to 0.2 milligrams daily. Um, essentially, you're increasing salt and water uptake and um, providing some more volume expansion. With, you need to uh, monitor potassium levels. They can drop with this. And um, so it's just something to keep an eye on while you're treating patients with blood. Midodrin uh, will also help with uh, elevating blood pressures. It's an alpha-1 adrenergic adrenal receptor agonist. It helps with peripheral arterial and venous constriction. Uh, I start patients off usually with two and a half to five milligrams three times a day and go up to 10 milligrams three times a day. It helps sort of in these POTS patients with low blood pressures to raise their blood pressure so that they can, uh, so that they have less reflexive tachycardia. It also helps if we need to get patients on a beta blocker, I uh, use midodrin and Florinap to get their blood pressures up a little bit more so they can tolerate the beta blocker. Um, with midodrin, it's key to explain to patients how to take it. Um, I tell people to take it first thing in the morning, then five hours, I'm sorry, four hours after that, and then another four hours after that. So for instance, 7 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m. Um, the half-life of midodrin is very short. So there's no use in taking it, you know, just twice a day, eight hours apart. You're missing the effect at that point. You do need to monitor for supine hypertension, and I do instruct patients also to not lie down within four hours of taking this medicine because there is a possibility of rapidly elevating the blood pressure while lying down. Beta blockers um, have been used in POTS for a while. There are studies on propranolol 20 milligrams TID, the short-acting version, that shows improved tachycardia and symptoms. Um, I've also prescribed propranolol an hour before exercise, which there is some data for also, uh, which can help with that, that inappropriate tachycardic response to movement uh, and can help blunt that so that patients can tolerate their exercise regimen. The soprolol has been looked at. It's a beta-2 adrenal receptor blocker and ideally cardioselective. Um, it prevents vasodilation, which is great, uh, and tachycardia, but it can also drop blood pressure. So it's I don't use it as much because I find patients' blood pressure drops too much on it, but it, it has been shown to help. Um, there are no studies on topol XL, natalol, or acebutalol, um, but at low doses, all of these work well, um, and they don't have a significant effect on blood pressure. Obviously, trial and error is needed. Sometimes I need to try multiple beta blockers before I can find one that works best. Uh, Natalol works well, but it's not cardioselective, so I avoid it in patients with asthma. Uh, Short-acting propranolol works well as uh, in sort of an ad-needed situation. And then the acebutalol, I've found, works very well in younger patients with uh, tachycardia resistant to other beta blockers. So Corlinor, um, Evabradine, is a funny channel blocker. It's sort of um, been a lifesaver for, for people like me who take care of patients with POTS blocks the sinus node, and it slows the heart rate without an effect on the blood pressure. Um, this, you know, is super useful, but super expensive, and a lot of times not covered for POTS patients without trial of other beta blockers and calcium channel blockers even um, to help with symptoms. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a last resort, but it does end up working well and not dropping blood pressure, which is nice. There was a retrospective case study that reviewed 20 patients treated uh, with this. Eight of them reported decrease in tachycardia and fatigue, four reported decrease in tachycardia. Here it is. Um, it was retrospective, uh, 49 patients. But this is another study, actually, I'm sorry, I apologize. This is another study with 49 patients, a retrospective analysis with a significant drop in sitting and standing heart rate. Um, Northera, hydroxydopa uh, is another medication that we use. It's the oral prodrug to norepinephrine. It was first studied in Parkinson's patients with orthostatic hypertension. It appears to also work anecdotally for POTS patients. Um, there was a small retrospective study of 37 patients treated for POTS with Northera that showed that the dizziness, syncope, and fatigue all improved. Um, again, you have to watch for supine hypertension with this medication. It is also hard to get covered for patients with POTS. They, Insurance companies will cover it if you demonstrate orthostatic hypotension, 
However, that's not necessarily what we're treating. Uh, I have been able to get it approved, however, in sort of a last resort scenario as well. And some patients really do benefit from it. It's, it's given three times a day. We start with 100 milligrams three times a day and then titrate it up. And it seemed to work well. Another medication that I like to use is the SSRIs and NRIs. It's uh, hard to, sometimes to convince patients with POTS to take these medications because they've been told for so many years or for so long that all, everything is in their head and they just have anxiety or they're depressed. And, you know, they're constantly trying to convince people that that's not the case. They don't have anxiety, that they're not depressed. And so when I bring these medications up with people, they're hesitant because uh, they don't want to be treated for anxiety and depression. However, I tell them specifically that I'm not using these medications for that purpose. I use it because there's an increased stimulation of the standing vasoconstriction reflex. So these medications can actually reduce venous pooling and increase orthostatic um, tolerance. Bupropion blocks norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake as well, which, um, which helps. Uh, of no effect, sir, um, which is, you know, a similar class of medication will worsen tachycardia and is not well tolerated. This is one of the medications I look for specifically in these patients who come in to see me for the first time with a diagnosis of POTS. They're on effect, sir. I, I take them off of it and I switch them to something else because it can cause a lot of tachycardia. Symbolt is useful for treating patients with both chronic pain and POTS, which, um, there is a lot of that. It's actually one of the triggers for POTS and patients with chronic pain develop some um, autonomic dysfunction and POTS symptoms. So it's an SNRI, norepinephrine and, um, and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And it also increases dopamine levels. But what I found is it, it really does raise blood pressure, which is useful in those patients with POTS who have a baseline low blood pressure. Pyridostigmine is another medication that's been looked at. Um, it's an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It augments that rest and digest arm of the autonomic nervous system. Um, there was a small study, 17 patients from 2005, that showed a mild drop in heart rate and improved symptoms in patients taking medication versus placebo. Uh, so I like to use this in, in my patients that have gastroparesis or decreased GI motility because it can increase the GI motility. It can cause nausea and um, some significant side of GI side effects as well. So, you know, just like all these other medications, it's been studied minimally and it's a little bit of a trial and error to see what works best for each individual patient and, and what their underlying sort of symptoms really are. Birth control is uh, super helpful. Patients often have fluctuations in symptoms with their cycle. Um, I strongly encourage patients to work with their gynecologists, either to place an IUD or to have some sort of continuous hormonal therapy so that they can eliminate their periods completely. Um, it's not contraindicated that estrogen-based therapies may actually increase blood pressure in some patients, which could also help with symptoms and help them tolerate beta blockers and other medications that will, will in turn help them feel better. So treatment for COVID long haulers, um, these patients have a lot of brain fog and fatigue, and I think it's directly related, at least in part, to um, their POTS and their tachycardia and the decreased blood flow to the brain. Um, so, you know, treating their POTS and treating their, their autonomic dysfunction symptoms does help with this. I've anecdotally found that antihistamines help with this as well. You know, this is something that I sort of started because of treating patients with POTS and mast cell activation syndrome, once their mast cell is under control with the use of antihistamines, their POTS symptoms really decline. So in patients with COVID, I've started trying them on antihistamines, which would be famotidine, 20 milligrams twice a day, and a high-dose um, uh, acorn blocker, like Allegra, Zyrtec, or uh, Claritin. Zyrtec, for instance, I titrate up to 20 milligrams twice a day. And in fact, I've had a lot of patients tell me that they had significant improvement in their brain fog and fatigue, and they've tried to actually wean off of these medications and their symptoms have come back. So I don't know what the mechanism is. I don't know why this is, but I, you know, I do tell patients that this is my anecdotal experience. Uh, I have no idea why this helps, but it's a pretty benign medication to try. So 
I encourage them to do the famotidine and the H1 blocker as well to see if it helps their symptoms. If it doesn't, we stop it, no big deal. Um, Low-dose naltrexone is another one that's sort of on the horizon. Um, it's, it's known actually to help with chronic pain and to help with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. There are studies that have shown both of those. So people with long hauler COVID have been started on it. And uh, anecdotally, it seems to be helping with the brain fog and the fatigue. Um, I have not used this a lot myself, uh, but I think it is something to very seriously consider given the fact that there is some research behind it in terms of chronic pain and uh, chronic fatigue. Um, I also wanted to mention that I've used clonidine patches a lot in these patients. A lot of post-COVID long haulers have these symptoms that they describe as surges. The surges seem to be elevated heart rate and blood pressure with a flushing sensation that occurs randomly throughout the day. Um, it can come on, last a few minutes or last you know, 10 to 15 minutes and then goes away again. When I put uh, these patients on a clonidine patch, I start at 0.1 milligrams, uh, the weekly transdermal patch. Those symptoms uh, abate and actually improve significantly. The heart rate fluctuations um, become less prominent and people actually feel uh, a little bit better. They can sleep better and they have a little bit less fatigue and brain fog. Um, I use the clonidine patches in a select population of people, obviously those that don't have low blood pressures. And, um, you know, if they don't tolerate, for, tolerate it for any reason, we can remove the clonidine patch easily. And it, it, there is not a reflex hypertension that's associated with it at that dose, which is good. So what else is out there? Um, Maybe on the horizon, if symptoms don't resolve with treatments, as I have discussed, um, there are procedures that can be considered, such as the sinus node, selective sinus node ablation. Um, this can be high risk for pacemaker, but people are developing new techniques all the time and seem to be coming up with strategies that limit the need for pacemaker after this procedure. Um, and there's been some limited studies, or not studies, but some anecdotal data that actually people are feeling better. Um, after this procedure, if all else has failed, which is exciting. So in summary, POTS is an underdiagnosed syndrome with a multitude of clinical manifestations. Lifestyle modifications can dramatically improve symptoms. And I just want to reiterate that exercise really is the most important thing. And what we're trying to do with all of these medications and lifestyle modifications is get patients to exercise. When I see patients for the first time, I hand them a handout that's called the POTS CHOP exercise handout. You can get it online. It's the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has created an exercise, 20 page exercise regimen for patients with POTS that can be followed on a daily basis, which really um, can kind of slowly reintroduce exercise into these patients. Um, I do have a patient who completely eliminated her POTS symptoms by starting to run half marathons. So she got off of her um, her beta blocker therapy completely, and she feels 100% back to normal. So once you can get to that kind of exercise, it really does help. Um, there are lots of different treatments, including volume expansion, SSRIs, beta blockers, and others. There's really uh, a matter of trial and error for each of these patients. Exercise, like I said, is super ben beneficial. And recognizing the syndrome, helps patients improve their quality of life. So when a patient's told you're not crazy, you don't have anxiety, you have POTS, um, oftentimes patients will come back and see me a, a month later after we've started some lifestyle modification and they've Googled POTS and they you know, can't believe how many of the symptoms correlate to what they have. Why has no one ever told them that this is what they have before? It's very um, validating and it really helps them sort of feel like there is hope and that maybe someday they can improve their symptoms and start having a functional life. So POTS post-COVID, um, essentially the first thing to do is work on volume expansion and compression. Uh, I've been using antihistamines, like I said, and they seem to be working in a large portion of patients. Uh, I slowly ease these people back into exercise. Um, I do check echoes on these patients and if they're, you know, just to make sure there's no potential myocarditis or pericarditis, which we do see also post-COVID. Um, and if needed, in order to resume an exercise regimen, I start treating them for positive. Um, 
go back to our clinical vignette. This patient, the 23 year old female was hot post COVID um, with long hauler symptoms. I started her on Natalol 40 milligrams daily after um, giving her instructions for all the lifestyle modifications that we've discussed. Um, she actually didn't tolerate that dose well, so we dropped it to 20 milligrams, which really worked well for improving her heart rate. She was able to get back to a regular exercise regimen and wean off the Natalol after she started back with Pilates and uh, walking every day. And she is feeling back to her baseline. She's no longer on medication and she's doing well. Um, unfortunately, not all the patients that I've seen have had this remarkable of a recovery. Um, similar to acute COVID, long haulers have an extremely variable course. And many of my patients I've been working with for over a year and are still symptomatic. So um, I don't have a cure. I certainly do try to help support these patients and improve their clinical symptoms, but there's clearly a lot we don't know. And um, it would be great you know, if we could help these patients more. Hence the need for you know, more vaccinations and you know, trying to end this pandemic because the more people that have COVID, the more people are gonna have this long hauler syndrome and a lot of them don't get better after after even a year. Here's some references I just wanted to put up for um, future reference. And um, I'm opening, I'm happy to join you all now live to answer any of your questions from this talk. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. We'll bring Dr. Cutchins up live shortly. Okay, perfect. Hi, Dr. Cutchins, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, thank you for such an incredible and timely talk. As you said, most of us are seeing these patients and it's very really challenging for them dealing with this. You've survived COVID, you thought you got through it and here you are now you're dealing with one of the long haul symptoms, POTS. So we do have some questions here for you. The first one is from Dr. Mehta. Could you tell us for orthostatics, are you asking them to stand for two minutes or five minutes when they're checking that and reporting to you? Yeah, so in our clinic, we do two minutes uh, sitting and then two minutes standing. But in order to really diagnose POTS in this way, you have to do uh, 10 minutes of standing. So really two minutes sitting and eight minutes of standing is probably adequate. But to show that change in heart rate from supine to the standing position that's sustained, you want 10 minutes in the upright position. Okay, that's great to know. This is from one of our attendees also. Are tryptase levels helpful prior to trial of antihistamines? Any other markers to check for? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of these patients in conjunction with pulmonology, immunology. You know, we have a, a team of doctors here at Emory who are all looking, you know, following these patients in particular. Um, I do send these patients for histamine levels and tryptase levels prior to starting the antihistamines. However, it is rare. I have never seen an elevated tryptase level. I have seen mildly elevated antihistamine levels, nothing in a diagnostic range. Um, it's, rare, it's really rare to get uh, that marker positive. The tryptase is a highly fluctuating um, marker. So if you have, if you're in a full-blown mast cell activation, um, episode, then maybe your tryptase level will be elevated. And unfortunately, oftentimes mast cell activation syndrome is not diagnosed unless you have that elevated tryptase level, which I think is a little um, sort of, uh, it, it doesn't really target what you're looking for. Uh, so a lot of these patients get these rashes, the heat-induced rashes or just random rashes, and, and they don't have an elevated tryptase level and they don't have elevated antihistamine levels, but once they start the Pepsid and the Zyrtec, for instance, those symptoms go away and their, their POT symptoms improve. So there's a spectrum there and not everyone has elevated markers. Um, the other markers we look at just routinely on these post-COVID patients are inflammatory markers like CRP, SED rate. Uh, we look at D-dimer levels. Uh, we try to, you know, Category, categorize these patients from those um, levels as well. But not all of them have elevated markers. Some of them have long hauler symptoms without any of that as abnormal. Great. In your experience, have you found that patients started on Midodrin had any worsening of their chest pain since it's a vasoconstrictor? So personally, I have not. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the chest pain mechanism is in POTS. Uh, it seems to me to be more related to tachycardia. Uh, 
So the more episodes of high heart rates, these patients seem to have an associated chest pain that comes with a tachycardia. And uh, the midodrine itself doesn't seem to cause a side effect of chest pain. Uh, it, in my experience, it's always related to high heart rates. Here's a question that I think goes into one that I was gonna ask you as well. Um, William Johnson asked, is there any benefit or contraindication for using a combination of beta blockers and minadrin? And that flows into the question I had is, is there an algorithm you use, a stepwise fashion, since there are so many drugs to use to treat post-COVID POTS, that you start with one drug and then you move on to the next one? How do you decide? Yeah, those are both really good questions. Um, so the first part of that question is, is it contraindicated or is it you know, not helpful to use midodrin and the beta blocker. It seems counterintuitive. Um, and I have, I get a lot of questions from primary care physicians. Why do you have my patients on midodrin and a beta blocker? Isn't one raising the blood pressure and the other one's lowering the blood pressure? And um, it's true, but uh, I use them in combination so that the patients can tolerate the beta blocker better. So we raise their blood pressure a little bit with the midodrin so that they can tolerate the heart rate lowering effect of the beta blocker, which is what I'm looking for. And the beta blockers I use, I try to use ones that avoid hypotension. So Topral XL, Natalol, Asbutalol, they, none of them really drop blood pressure that much. They're not very good antihypertensives, uh, but they do help a lot with the heart rate. So I try to use fluorinephimidadrin in some ways to raise patients' blood pressures that blunts that tachycardic response, but also helps them tolerate some of these other medications. Calcium chelator blockers as well, I use you know often. So it helps sort of mitigate. Um, the question of what, what do you start with? How do you even begin to treat these patients with medications is an excellent one. Um, a lot of the times it comes with sort of flushing out what the underlying symptoms really are or the underlying pathophysiology. So if I have a patient who has Raynaud's, I often start with a calcium channel blocker because I'm looking to try to help or not aggravate their Raynaud's symptoms. Um, if I have a patient who has high blood pressure and POTS, then sometimes I'll use, you know, I'll just start with a clonidine patch because I know that's gonna help those blood pressure peaks and help regulate their heart rate. Um, the midodrine and Fluorinef work well, sort of as first line for POTS because they sort of augment what, what's already failing. And so, and then their heart rate con, kind of comes down in response. But honestly, it's, it's a sort of, it's a matter of individualizing treatment for each patient and and sort of trying to figure out what, what target would work best for, for him or her. Have you seen any lowering of blood pressures with evabridine? So personally, I haven't. Um, I use it a fair amount, but not a lot. Most of my patients, you know, start off, I, I sort of get onto a regimen of a combination of um, volume expansion, you know, treating underlying things like anemia, iron deficiency, menstrual cycle fluctuations. And then I start with, you know, trying to get their, their uh, blood pressure up a little bit with the midodrine or the Fluorinef and then adding in the beta blocker. Usually I can get patients to tolerate beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. It's, it, you know, I do use the Corlinor as the last resort, but personally I haven't seen drops of blood pressure on it. And it's good for me to hear some of the other agents that you use, because one of the challenges I've had is getting Evabridine approved. Um, yeah. And I've actually had to write letters, uh, medical necessity letters saying that this patient has tried all these other agents and remains symptomatic and they're um, lifestyle limiting as far as the symptoms. I'm still waiting to hear on the one patient uh, that I sent the letter in on, but that has been one of the biggest challenges, that and cost, as you said. Yeah, and so, and, and Corlinor and Northera, which is that droxydopa, um, are both very hard to get approved. And both they're both very expensive medications, and uh, but both really do work pretty well. So hopefully in the pipeline, as studies are being performed and retrospective um, meta-analysis are being performed, we'll get some more information about treatment of POTS and those, those medications will be, you know, used a little bit more frequently for that indication and hence, you know, covered by insurance, which would be helpful. I hope so. Um, here's a question from another attendee. I wish I had seen this presentation last week. We had a patient who was dealing with symptomatic tachycardia in our cardiac cath lab. He was not diagnosed with POTS, but was told that his tachycardia was related to anxiety. He had been suffering with symptoms for years and was frustrated with the healthcare system. He became upset that his cath was negative and the physician was going to discharge him to home 
his heart rate went from 90s to sitting to 160s SVT. That resolved within minutes, but because of this, the patient was admitted. Do you see patients with POTS without positional changes? I was wondering if he was a possible POTS patient. Um, so uh, the definition of POTS is really postural orthostatic tach tachycardia syndrome. So we define it by you know excessively high heart rates with standing, although it sounds like this patient probably had a component of that. Um, there's also inappropriate sinus tachycardia, which sort of covers, you know, there's a spectrum and it falls in that spectrum. And I, I see patients for that as well and, and treat a lot of inappropriate sinus tachycardia in the same way I treat POTS. Um, that's, you know, really more diagnosed with fluctuations in heart rate that aren't related to standing. So if you're just sitting, you know, watching TV and your heart rate pops up to 160 for no reason, and it's not an SVT and it's not something that we can ablate and it, it looks like sinus tack on the mon monitor, then that's, you know, what we're treating. And I use beta blockers for that. I use volume expansion. I treat underlying um, abnormalities for that as well. So it's, it's quite possible, you know, when I see these patients originally, the initial workup I do, I really look for anemia because I have diagnosed patients with anemia a lot. Uh, I send them to hematology or I send them to OBGYN and their fibroids get removed and all of a sudden they no longer have POTS, right? So um, I look for anemia, I look for underlying other underlying abnormalities like thyroid dysfunction. Um, and then I start, you know, the process of this hydrating, et cetera. Uh, a lot of these patients, you can see if you have them in the hospital, if you give them two or three liters of IV fluid and their symptoms improve and they start feeling better, then you have a pretty indi good indication that, um, that they may respond to oral hydration as well and that they may you know, benefit from that, so. This is our last question. Are stimulants typically used for treatment uh, of ADHD contraindicated in patients with a diagnosis of POTS? Now that's a good question too. I have a lot of patients that come in to see me who are already on stimulants and they tell me very specifically that their POTS symptoms occurred well after they had started taking stimulants for ADHD. So they've been on Adderall for years and all of a sudden they de develop POTS um, symptoms. And I believe them and it's true. And I often don't stop their stimulant for that reason, because it seems like the POTS is separate from their need to take the medication for their ADHD. Um, I have some patients with brain fog uh, from their POTS who have actually been treated with some stimulants. stimulants. We try to avoid ones that cause tachycardia, um, which exist, but um, for the most part, you know, they, they do feel better. So uh, they're not contraindicated, but it is a good medication to think about and, and review with your patient when you're considering the diagnosis of POTS. If the stimulant was just recently started and then they started developing these symptoms, it could be related and maybe they should try a different stimulant. Thank you very much, Dr. Cutchins, for your excellent talk. Um, and I'm sure uh, at least now we know how best to handle these patients. We have at least a starting point on how to approach these patients now when we see them in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me.